Yo, 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 what the fuck is up, man? It's John in the motherfucking house with Dope Talk TV Networks. I have a really, really special guest in the house. I got Mitchell Chamale. Okay, what the fuck is up, man? What's up, man? How you doing? I love that intro music. Uh, one of the homies always walks out into that and just gets my blood going anytime I hear it. How's everything with you, man? It's good, good, bro. Like, I'm super excited. I'm super excited that you're here. How's your day going, man? How's it going? It's a busy day. I just had an event over the weekend in uh, Tallahassee. Had had two events before that. So every weekend I've been really busy. So um, today's my first uh, Monday back after a few events. Uh, exhausted. I'm tired, but I'm, I'm loving it. And you're like, you're driving most of the time or how does yeah, that work? Yeah, man. You know, by the time you go check into the airport, figure out your car situation or getting dropped off and then figure out your car situation in a new town, it's too much headache. So in Florida, I just drive from place to place. It's like a a three and a half hour drive to Tallahassee, but I have my vehicle when I'm there. I have all my shit with me. I don't have to worry about checking bags. So I prefer to drive. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people that prefer to drive. Um, me personally, because I've done a lot of traveling. Like, it's a pain in the ass, especially international, man. Like, yeah. it's 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 crazy, man. So most of your traveling's in the States and Florida. What's your, what's your most favorite city you've been to so far? Uh, Tallahassee is my favorite city, man. Anyone who came to the event over the weekend, it's, it's pretty obvious why. The venue, the people... Um, you know, we don't really have a bunch of fighters in Tallahassee. We bring a lot of people in from everywhere else, but the fans there are really educated and they understand what high level and good MMA is. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like a, it's just a, it's a special, unique place to do MMA events at. I don't think any other promotion could go to Tallahassee and be successful. It's like our, it's like our, um, it's our stomping grounds. Okay. So that's kind of just like your home, like your, that's where, that's where it started. Right? Yeah. That's where it all started. You see a. Uh, a kid from Tally, my boy Josh Saman, the guy that we started the promotion with, my co-founder. Um, both of us were in Tallahassee, two young knuckleheads, and uh, that's where we started the event. So, it, you know, even though we don't, I don't live there anymore. It feels like home anytime I'm back there. And how long has it been open for? Um, the 11 year mark just hit on January 21st. So we had an event here in Orlando, and it was our 11 year uh, anniversary. That's insane! Wow, that's that's crazy, man. I mean, shout out to you, bro. That's <laughs> that's really hard to do, man. You know, a lot of people don't realize like what comes with like starting a business and a lot of people doubting you as well. Were there a lot of people doubting you in the beginning? The list is way longer than the people that were supporting us. Um, you know, we had some great supporters and some sponsors that are still with us today after 11 years, like Hobbit American Grill, Sherry and Bill Carpenter. Amazing, amazing. They're not just sponsors, they're friends as well. Lance Maxwell and Lance Maxwell Plumbing again, you know, not just a sponsor, but now he's like, a, you know, they're family to me now. So um, it's great. You know, we've had a, those few people that did support us got us to where we are today now we show them the same love you know it, it, nothing changed for them it's like you know everyone else's the prices went up but if you were with us and you were rocking with us in the beginning the prices are still the same word that's real bro yeah. that's real i support that that's so true that's how i rock too man yeah. i'll be rocking that way too bro the people that like started with you from the bottom man like the people that really believe in you like you shouldn't be changing the price up on them you know uh, what i'm saying like ever bro and that's on everything guys i'm talking about every type of business all right so i hope you guys are listening and taking notes um so man i see that you know you're a pro fighter you got a black belt you know what i'm saying you're a ceo you're a proud father how many kids do you have uh, i got two kids i got a boy and i got a girl how old uh, my boy is six he's on his way to be seven and my little girl she's actually uh 17 months old on coming up on March 6th, but her adjusted age, she she's like 13 months. So she was born wow. four months early. Oh, she's fresh then. Yeah, yeah. She was born four months early, so she's extra tiny. She's still only like 17 pounds. That's crazy. Um, my boy's nine month old, nine month old was where they were playing together and he was like five pounds. You could just see the size difference. That's crazy, man. Yeah, I don't I don't have any kids yet. I'm 27. How old are you? Uh, I'm 37. You're 37, yeah. bro. You don't even look 37, bro. I thought you were like <laughs> like 30, like early 30, bro. Nah, I'm 30. I'm 37. I, I, I always say, man, MMA keeps me young. Get in there and training with these young bucks. You know, I can't I can't be fucking around with them. Like, yeah, if I take off two or three weeks and try to come back in the gym. I'm getting my ass whooped. Facts. And it's real easy to say, you know what? I'm just, I'm just getting too old for this. I need to chill. But um, it really just drives me to do better and be better. So I like the ass whoopings, you know, but they yeah. don't happen often. I promise you that I'm in there with them and I'm, 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 we're rocking. They know that if they're getting around with me. They're getting a real round. It's not, I'm not just a promoter. I'm not just some guy doing it on the side. I'm, I'm there to rock with them. Yeah. You're there yeah. through the dirt and all, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. That's, that's what's up, bro. That's cool, man. And you know, what's crazy is that like, how long did it take you to get that black belt and what type of discipline comes behind it? That's, that's one of my questions for that. You know, the black belt took a long time. I think everyone's journey is a little bit different. Okay. Um, mine started in Tallahassee with a guy named Zecro, um, Felipe Neto. Uh, gave me a really good foundation. I was a blue belt with him, and I had been doing it for about six years when I moved to Orlando. 
I stayed with the same gym expecting to have that. Um, Cause when, it, when you switch gyms, you know, you get into a new system and they're like, all right, well, you're kind of starting over new at a blue belt now. It doesn't matter how long you've had the blue belt. You're starting new with me because you got to figure out my system. So I was like, well, I'm staying with Alliance. I'm going to be, I'm still in the same system. I ain't going to be held back. Yeah. Well, I got to Orlando and I, my blue belt lasted a little bit longer. So I had a very long journey to getting my black belt. Um, I want to say in, in total, probably eight or nine years. Wow. Yeah. Not including the wrestling and stuff I had before. And, you know, my first six years of jujitsu, I was doing two and three classes a day in the gi. Um, very dedicated. I really, really enjoyed the gi work. And it wasn't until um, I got my purple belt here in Orlando. And then once I got my purple belt, um, I had my black belt within two years. But getting uh, the, you know, maybe three, but the getting to purple belt was like a seven year journey. It was a very, very long journey for me. That's, but that's, that's a lot, man. That's a long time, bro. Yeah, I was beating black belts in competition when I was a blue belt. Um, I was, I was, I was competing. I was very active and yeah, honestly, really, um, I had an instructor that kind of robbed me of the passion of jujitsu when I got my purple belt and I kind of fell off from there. I, I stopped competing as much. I stopped training as much in the gi and I really started like going towards MMA more. I mean, I was a professional fighter already, but, uh, jujitsu always was like what I was really passionate about. And then I just, you know, I had the wrong instructor and, and it, I kind of fell off. So I went from training two or three times a day, blue belt, purple belt, and then, after that, it was kind of like, yeah, I'm doing it for fun more than anything. But I was still active, just more so no gi than the gi. So there's people that have like belt, black belts, but they're not just, they're not good instructors. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, it's, you know, just because you got a black belt doesn't mean you're a good human being, doesn't mean that you're a good person, doesn't mean that you're good at anything but jujitsu. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think there's a false conception there about people that have a black belt um, being that, you know, oh, they're a good mentor, they're a good teacher, or they're good at this, or they're good at that. And in reality, it just means they're good at jujitsu. Mm. And are you an instructor yourself? I do teach sometimes. Um, my home school for jujitsu is Tough as Nails BJJ in Oviedo, and um, I do get the honor to teach sometimes over there. I really enjoy teaching single classes or individuals by themselves. I hate being the guy that's got to come up with a curriculum or to teach every day sounds like a nightmare to me. Like I don't want to be that guy. It's, yeah, it's a lot of dedication, a lot of hard work to be a good instructor and to be there every day. It's not something you can just do half ass. It's, it's, it takes a lot of time to do it correctly. And what's the what's the biggest mistake fighters come and like like what's the biggest mistake fighters do when they walk into the octagon? Like what what's your number one on the and list? I think the biggest mistake normally happens before they ever walk into the octagon. If I'm being honest, but once they're in the octagon, um, it's it's pushing the pedal to the to the floor. You know, I see a lot of guys, especially in their first fights, second, third fights. Sometimes even you know they've had a few fights and they just come out. And it's one speed and that speed is 100 percent and that speed is straightforward um you know you got you got nine minutes if you're an amateur you got 15 minutes if you're a pro there's no need to rush the process you know you spend eight weeks getting to that moment where you're going to get into the cage you know the last thing you need to do is run forward and start swinging be smart you know um treat it treat it treat it like with patience you spend eight weeks to get there so if it, in my opinion the biggest mistake they make is just press mashing the gas and going full speed you see a lot of guys that'll gas out or they get real tired and they're they don't think about their breathing and everything else that goes involved into fighting but um yeah once they step in the cage the biggest mistake is probably just balls to the wall yeah when you when you lose a fight do you feel like a lot of people not just you specifically but just anybody period that you've seen um do they lose confidence in themselves after that loss or do you, do you feel like they do you feel like some of them take it real personal do you feel like you should yeah, man, I think you should. I think you should take it real personal. You know, this is a man on man sport. This is a one on one sport. While you have a team behind you and your, you know, your, your training partners and your coaches are there and they're trying to guide you to a victory. At the end of the day, there is it's you versus another man. And um, there's nothing in my mind that's more defeating than losing that one on one battle. You know, if you're playing football, it's real easy to say, oh, he missed the block. Oh, he didn't throw the ball far enough or oh, he. He should have ran faster, you know, whatever. You can blame your teammates, but when it comes to that cage, there's no one else to blame really but yourself. So um, I do believe you should take it hard, but, you know, take it hard by getting in the gym and um, busting your ass and, and striving to be greater because I see a lot of guys who take it hard and they go to the bar, they skip training for three weeks, four weeks, and, you know, they're not in the gym. And it's like, man, it's, you know, yeah, that's one way to take it hard, but the, the right way to take it hard is to go train harder, Put in the work and make sure the same mistakes don't happen again. Yeah. So, so the drinking and the smoking won't really help you out. <laughs> nah, it doesn't do much for you. But it doesn't. I see a lot of guys, man. You know, it's 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 part of the sport too. You know, um, got even when they win. You know, even when guys win, they go out and start partying and and getting hammered. And it's like, man, 
you know, and, unless you're Kamar Usman, unless you're John Jones and you're in the top of the, of the league, top of the sport, top of the world. Um, and, but I don't think you should be doing that if you want to get there. You know, if you want to get there and you want to be that guy one day, there's a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifices that got to be made. And that's probably outside of the cage. For me, the biggest mistake guys are making is not making the sacrifices. Like, you know, they're, they're eating the junk food. Um, they're, they're skipping the cardio sessions. They're, they're going to all the training, all the sparring. Yeah. All that, all that, that's the fun stuff. Who doesn't want to spar exactly. and, yeah. and punch your boy in the face, yeah. but they're skipping out on the hard dieting. They're skipping out on the, um, discipline of the cardio work on their own, the sauna, the, the pool. I mean, it, there, you know, there's endless things that you can do for yourself outside of the gym that I see a lot of guys not making the sacrifices for. Okay. And when it comes to training, do you, do you train during the day and nighttime? Like, is there just how many sessions are there when um, it comes to, to training? I typically train, um, during the day, every day, at least one or two, um, classes a day. And then I try to get in a session at night, at least once at night. Um, now that I have a kid, now that I have kids, those a little bit harder. It's funny. I used to clown on guys that could only train once a day or maybe couldn't train because they had kids. I'm like, Oh, what are you talking about? It can't be that difficult. Now I got kids and it's that fucking difficult. Yeah, man. I, I hear it all the time. Like I'm actually dating a girl that has a kid, like a five-year-old and like, you know, I'm, I'd be playing like stepdaddy, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And it's like, man, like it's, it's tough. It's not, it's not as easy as, you know, some people say it is, you know, cause yeah. I know some people that are, oh, it's not too bad. Just have kids, man. Just do it. And then I hear people that are like, nah, man, just take it easy. You know what yeah. I mean? But I heard it's life changing. Like how did, how did it feel when you first put, you know, you had your, your kid in your hand for the first um, time? Man, there's, I always say like some of the greatest moments in my life really came inside of that cage, but the greatest moment in my life was being a dad. Like I didn't know that's what I was meant to do in my life. I didn't understand that growing up, you know, I always knew I wanted to be a dad, but I didn't know that that was like my true, like that's what I'm supposed to do in my life. I'm supposed to be a father, like no doubt about it. Um, I absolutely adore my son and my daughter. I would, I would kill somebody for them. I would take my own life for them. You name it. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. But like that to me is like, you know, if you had me to categorize, I do a lot of shit, but being a dad, being a father is, is, is my goal. It's, it's my, it's my, my path in life. It's what I'm supposed to do with my life. That's, that's insane, man. Yeah. That's, that's cool, man. Shout out to you, bro. Cause there's a lot like nowadays, man, I feel like a lot of people are having kids and they're not meant to be fathers and mothers. You know what I mean? Like they're not meant to be parents. Like I feel like everyone deserves to have a kid, but like if you're not willing to put in the work and really raise this child, right. Because mental health is like a big deal right now in America. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So what's what's your opinion on like, you know, shitty parents, man? Like, what do you got to say about them? Man, man? I, des I despise them, man. I don't know. Like, don't get me wrong. There is all day. There is um, there's times when you got to put a screen in front of your kid, you know? Um, oh, there should, yeah. There should be some learning stuff. It should be something to, to add value to their life. Um, and it shouldn't be because you want to uh, play video games. It shouldn't be because you want to, you know, um, bail out on your duties as a dad or a mother. Um, I mean, it's hard being a, it's hard being a father. It's hard being a mom. I mean, I, it's just yeah. hands like I, I, I can't even explain to you how hard my, my wife's job is. Like she's a stay at home mom and what she does every day when I watch her do, I want no part in. It's way harder than what I do. You know, I'm there for the fun stuff. I, yeah. help, I help out around the house and I help her and stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's not easy being a dad. It's not easy being a mom. But, you know, once you choose to have a kid and, and that person now relies on you to, to understand how to be a good adult one day or how to be a, a good member of society, um, I, I just, yeah, I don't think there's anything else you should be putting above your children once you have them. Like, that's that's the new priority. I don't care what you do. I was a professional fighter. Once I had my boy, um, I was no longer number one in my life. It was my son. Do you, do you want him to be a fighter just like you? Not at all. Really? Not one bit. Wow. That's crazy. I wasn't expecting that. Why? I mean, I'm, I'm doing that hard work for him. He don't, mm. not, he, don't, he don't need to do that. I want him to understand AI. I want him to understand, you know, all the new technology coming out. I want him to be able to code. Uh, I want him to be able to make millions of dollars and keep his brain intact and not have to worry about getting hit in the head or, or like avoiding being hit. Yeah. With that being said, if that's what he wants to do. I'm going to, I'm going to encourage it and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to um, help him do whatever he wants to do in his life. But I'm not, I'm not actively encouraging him to be a fighter now. I'm not actively like, oh, you're going to fight one day or, oh, I can't yeah. wait. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. do any of that. Okay. He does jujitsu. He'll hit mitts. Um, even if he does want to fight, he won't spar until he's 18. It's not going to happen in my house. You know, once he's, once he's an adult, then he can do what he wants to do. But as long as he's under 18 years of age, he won't be sparring. Um, and I'm sure he'll do it behind my back, but I don't want him to, I don't want him to fight at all. 
Okay, that's crazy. And I, to be honest, man, I'm not really like I'm not into fighting. I'm not really into like watching it on TV. I'm gonna be real with you. Um, you know, I know there's so many different styles of, of fighting, right? So like, do you guys match each other up with like the style of fighting that they use, or is it just you know, hey, bro, you do whatever you want? Yeah, I mean, it's MMA, so you know, styles make fights. So we try to make the most. Um, appealing fights according to styles like you know you can put and it can happen a lot of ways you can put two wrestlers together two high level wrestlers and maybe you get an awesome grappling exchange fight um maybe they both stand and just brawl it out because their wrestling you know um cancels out each other you can put a high level striker with a high level wrestler and see if the striker can avoid being taken down or see if the you know uh, grappler can get him down so you know there's, there's not really any particular way to match the fight but we always want to make sure it's as evenly matched as possible we don't want to put you know, an 0 and 5 guy with a 5 and 0 guy that's going to get mashed out. Like we want the fans to be entertained. And um, e while knockouts are entertaining, it's, it's pretty obvious if someone doesn't belong in the cage. And uh, we realized a long time ago that no matter how many tickets someone sells, you know, Cedric Lusant, someone who's been on your show, he's a, he's a great ticket seller. You can look at all of his opponents with us. We put them against dogs. We put them against tough fights. And yeah. it's helped him improve and get better to the point now he can be a pro athlete. And he can pursue, you know, fighting tougher and tougher and tougher guys. Because eventually, one day, if the goal is to get to the UFC, you're going to be fighting the toughest guys in the world. Yeah. So if we just gave you the bummest guys in the world, how am I going to help? How are we helping you yeah, out? Yeah. You get on national TV, and now you get your ass whooped in front of all your friends and family that thought you were a badass. It's like, nah, that's not cool. Yeah, that's not cool at all. Yeah, man, I never thought of it like that, man. There's a lot of like thought that goes behind that, and like. Like, do you hire, like, how many people do you have hired under, like, combat? Like, um, Honestly, man, when you see the, the, the events and everything we're running, um, like, every event, there's probably eight people that are always part of those. Um, and then there's five people who are working behind the scenes before the event ever happens to make sure the event happens. Um, the, two, the two or three biggest ones would probably be Richard Cox, who's my matchmaker. He's been with me since the very beginning. Um, the, the next one would probably be Brandy Spivey, my fiance. She runs the whole front end. She does a lot of the graphic design work as well. And then um, Angel Marquez, uh, he's like my right hand man with opera. Like just kind of like day to day shit. Um, he lives in Orlando with me. Richard's in Georgia. Brandy, my wife, obviously lives with me. And then um, Ramsey White, he's my production guy. He handles all of the online streaming and yeah. um, a lot of the operations behind it. So he's like booking doctors and ambulances and making sure that everything's you know where it needs to be on yeah because i was about to say there's a lot of things that come behind it even just the girls walking on you know doing the what do you call those the the ring girls yeah the ring girls and you know people that do lighting you have security i'm pretty sure that you hired security yeah. too right because has there any, has there any been like anything crazy over like the 11 years of you doing this anything crazy like no. anything wild in 150 years we've had two real incidents uh 150 events not years okay we've had two real incidents one of them was a girl her boyfriend was fighting and um i think he was losing wasn't going his way. She was drunk. She swung on somebody that was cheering for the other person. She actually missed and head butted the ground and they kicked her out for fighting. And I was like, why'd they kick her out? What, what's going on? And they're like, oh, she was trying to fight. And I'm like, trying to fight? What do you mean? Look at her face. And they're like, yeah, she slipped and, and fell on the ground. So that was one. And then the other one, we had an issue in Jacksonville where a brawl broke out. Someone's brother got beat. Um, but we, we did a pretty good job of getting it all under control. And yeah. I mean, for 150 events, like that's nothing. That's I mean, nothing at all, man. Yeah, Only two. There's some events that every single fight night there's, you know, they, they just don't understand. Hey, a part of it has to do with, I think, um, ticket prices, you know, the lower the ticket price, the, 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 the more riff raft that can come in really? as part of the event. Wow. And then also, um, it starts from the top. So it starts with me, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't try to encourage people to, um, disrespect each other in the cage or disrespect each other at weigh-ins. Um, I don't I don't play any of that shit. If a fan's saying something stupid, I have no problem going up to him and being like, nah, we don't do that here. Um, which happens often, you know. Fans I mean, it's a weigh-in, right? I mean, they come in and they're going they're already trying to be tough oh, yeah. and, and and look each other in the eye. Like I heard a I heard a podcast, man. Sorry to interrupt you, man. Okay. Um I, I seen a podcast clip, I forgot who it was, but like I, there was some some reason why they stare at each other in the eyes. Why do they do that? at the weigh-ins man you're looking you're looking for a chink in the armor you know i'm doing the same thing if you watch me as i'm standing there and there's a guy two guys in front of me i'm looking at both of their eyes and i'm looking for, for a chink i'm looking for them to look away i'm looking for them to like look down hey and some guys walk up and they're looking down from the beginning they're not even looking in the eyes they're just looking down those are the scary those tend to be the scariest ones. why would you look down i would never look down those tend to be the scariest ones man those are the guys that always end up coming out and doing some crazy shit like if i'm being honest like, yeah historically speaking those are the craziest people the ones that walk up and don't even make eye contact 
Yeah. But then, I mean, I'm looking at each other. I'm trying to see, like, are they looking through each other? Because sometimes you can see a guy and he's looking straight through him. And yeah. it's like, ooh. ooh. What yeah. does that mean? You know exactly. what I mean? You trying to kill me or what? What's up, man? <laughs> that's crazy, man. Like, yeah, that's true, bro. But I would never look down, bro. I would never. I'll be looking at this motherfucker right in the eye, man. And not the a lot soul. of people. There's a handful of guys that do it. Yeah. And I promise you, every guy that's done it comes out and looks like a savage. He's a beast. Is it? Is it true? Like the guy that's like more like rowdy and more loud is the guy that's like gonna lose, or do you feel like the more confident you are and more rowdy you are, you feel like? Like, does that really come into play? What's your opinion on that? Like, it's a toss up, man. We got a guy named Jeremy Williams. I'm sure everybody's tired of me talking about him by this point, but um, his uh, name's who's that? What's his Jer name? Jeremy Williams. Jeremy Williams. All but, right, shout out um, to you. He comes out, man. He's entertaining as fuck from the very begin, very first time the camera's on him at weigh-ins. He starts being entertaining, and he doesn't stop being entertaining until his hand is raised. He's undefeated with us. He's four and zero, you know. And to hear it from him, and he puts extra pressure on himself on purpose. Like, hey. I got to perform because I'm putting this extra pressure on my shoulders. I got to perform. Yep. I'm putting myself out here. Um, and yo, and if he fails, you know, it's, it's going to, he's going to get a lot of shit, a lot of shit, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily, um, a good thing or a bad thing, or it means anything. Um, sometimes it is false bravado. It is somebody that's, they don't have it. They know they don't have it. And they're just trying to pretend like they got it. But you know, if I'm being honest with how many events we've done now, 150 events in, I can tell so much by looking at a guy, by how he's acting, if it's being genuine, if he's not being genuine. Um, and I have a good tell for those things. I, I don't think that most of their opponents do. They understand it. But, you know, from being in the sport for as long as I've been in the sport, I see it. The body language and the psychology of all of it, yes. too, right? Yep. You know, that's that's big. I've been in sales for a long time and um, I, I used to do timeshare. I used okay. to sell timeshare for a little That's bit. A hard hustle. It was hard. I did it for a couple of years, man. And it taught me a lot about body language and, and, and you know, the psychology of the sale. Yeah. Like you can know the whole script, but the psychology of it, of, you know, of, of how to get, a, get away with things. It's oh, crazy, yeah. man. It's, it's crazy how the mind works like um, psychology. So, what what's your opinion on that when it comes to fighting? You think that's important? Mental is number one. If you don't got it mentally, then you don't got it. It is all there is to it. And you can look at guys from the highest level to the lowest levels, you know, the maniacs and the guys that are um, doing the most outside of the cage. I will say there are some exceptions now. You know, you got your Mike Tysons, you have your John Jones, you have these guys that can be complete maniacs and don't have it mentally. Um, but then I've seen guys that are like uh, some, some of the like least talented people I know, but they're very confident and they believe in their skill set and they get in there and they believe they're unstoppable. They believe that no one can beat them. Even though they've been beat two or three times, they still believe no one can beat them. That was a fluke. That was bullshit. You know, yeah. I messed up. I made a mistake and they got lucky. It's like, to me, mental is everything. Um, and I know some guys that are, are, I mean, in the gym, they are absolute killers. They're world beaters. But whenever it comes time to perform under those lights, psh, they shut down. It's insane. It's, it's, it's one of the weirdest things to see happen whenever you're training with a guy and you know this guy's a savage. He whoops your ass all the time. Yeah. And then he goes and fights somebody that you know he should beat. And he gets his ass whooped and it's like, what? How? But it's just because you don't got it up here. You don't got it. That's crazy. I feel like that, that comes into play with everything too in the real world. Like sure. if you don't have it up here, you know what I mean? Everyone goes through their depressions and stuff like that, yep. you know? And you, I remember one time a point in my life where I was so depressed, man. I didn't want to come out of my room. I didn't want to talk to nobody, man. And like it affected my life big time, man. Yeah. So like when, you know, coming out of that, like it, it really changed my life and my perspective. Um, what's your what's your like top three goals for this year uh top three goals for this year yeah well maybe just for you know the, the business maybe for a specific fighter uh maybe just for yourself yeah i mean I, by the end of the year if we don't have 10 guys in the ufc i'll be disappointed so that's a goal of mine i believe we have you know we have guys like jeremiah mcdougall val woodburn um these guys that are undefeated we got guys coming up like kenny augusto we got donovan hedrick um we got in duval we got ramon Tavares. we've got we just got all, all these guys that are right there on the cusp of getting in it's a matter of just getting in the right fights um good experienced guys that you know they, obviously they have to win they have to perform but um yeah i, I think by the end of the year i want to have 10 guys from combat night representing in the ufc on March 25th, we have two guys from Combat Night both fighting on the same car. They're not fighting each other, but uh, Preston Parsons and Lucas Alexander are both fighting on March 25th. That's pretty cool. You know, there's only going to be 10, 12 fights on that card. 
and two of them are from us. It's like, yeah. Hell yeah, that's, that's cool, bro. And I, I seen recently, man, uh, I think last uh, Cedric's fight, right? Recently, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a professional fighter that came and watched that. What was his name? He's from Miami. I forgot his name. Uh, Jorge Masvidal. Yeah, man. He's, he's uh, I think he was founded by Kimbo Slice, right? Yep, he was back in the bare knuckle uh, boxing days in the in the backyard, the backyard fights. Yeah, yeah, I seen a couple, man. He's that's crazy, man. And R.P. Kimbo, man, that's wild. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, what's the process of you like getting them into into UFC? Like, how does that how does that even work? They just come in and like, hey, man, I want this guy. Like, that's just how it works, or no? It's like anything else in life. It's who you know. Mm. I mean, at the end of the day, I know some of the some of the better fighters in the world that never got a chance to perform in the UFC. you got guys like uh, Louis Palomino Baboon, who is um, down in Bare Knuckle. He's their champ. Uh, he, he more than deserved a shot in, in the UFC, and he never fought there. Um, but it really comes down to, like, it's a timing thing. You know, it could be just as simple as they need your weight class, your own weight, and you got the right record. Okay, cool, you get the call. But to get the call, you got to know the right person. So you can have all, you can have the, the best record, you could be a, a killer. You could have all knockouts, all these things going for you. But if you don't have someone that knows somebody there that can put your name under, under, on the list, it's like it you're, you're, doesn't matter. So it's, a big part of it is knowing the right people, um, being consistent, staying active. You know, some of these guys want to fight once a year and it's like, cool. You know, it's a hobbyist though. You're not, you're not a real professional fighter. You're a professional fighter, but if you're fighting once a year, I mean, what are you trying to do? You know, you got guys that are fighting three and four times a year. Yeah, it was about, that was my next question, three or four times a year. That's crazy. And man, like, I don't know if you heard about that boxer that passed away. Not passed away, but he has, like, brain injury. Oh, yeah, it's been around for a while. Yeah, man, like, does that does that happen, like, on a regular, like? Well, I mean, here's the thing, man. Whenever you suck out as much weight as some of these guys suck out, um, the last thing that you're, you're going to rehydrate is going to be your brain, you know, your organs. And um, that's why I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, I'm, I'm big, I want to see early, early weigh-ins for all these events. You know, for us, we're, uh, we're one of the few regional promotions in Florida, maybe even the whole country. But when UFC started doing the 10 a.m. weigh-ins, we got the Florida Boxing Commission. You know, in Tallahassee, we had a 10 a.m. weigh-in. So guys are getting an extra almost, you know, 12 hours of time to recover before their fight the next day. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't like cutting a whole bunch of weight. And I say that um, I cut a whole bunch of weight when I competed. I was always 155, and I cut down to 125, so I cut 30 pounds. But um, I hate seeing these guys cut as much weight as they cut. You know, you see guys coming in on their deathbed and they're still a pound over. It's like, man, fight, fight a weight class up. Yeah. Feel, feel good, you know. Feel good because it seems like you guys are like whooping your like yourself, bro. Like, cause you can't be too tired when you come into that ring, bro. Exactly. Like, you know, so like you gotta hit the saunas, you gotta you gotta eat right, you yep. gotta like extra train. Like, do those sweatsuits work? They work to an extent. I mean, if you uh if you have access to a sauna, uh the sauna is what you want to be in. But you know, I see guys that's the thing too. There's so many guys making mistakes on weight cuts. There's no book that tells you this is how you should cut weight for your body type in the city that you live in, you know, and, and for the tools that you have available. There's a bunch of people out there that will say what's worked for them and put little things out there. But really getting good at cutting weight, it's a, it's a process. You just got to learn. You've got to figure it out for yourself. Your body. Your, yeah, yeah. How your body reacts to things and what your body can do. And then, um, like, again, it's sacrifices. Like, people don't want to sacrifice the food they're eating. People don't want to sacrifice the time of day they're eating the food. People don't want to sacrifice and do the extra cardio. So they think on fight week, oh, I'll just, you know, lose 15 pounds. And it's like, well, you could have made the sacrifices for the past six weeks and you'd have seven pounds to lose. That's hard. That's yeah. hard to fucking do. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. But, yeah. do it. but if you're going to do it right, you, you know, it's going to take a lot of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the main thing. I feel like anything in life, you have to sacrifice something. Yeah, if you want to do something great, I mean, if you want to fucking go bag groceries at Publix, you don't have to sacrifice anything. Anyone can do that, but not anyone can fight. They used to say that in timeshare. They'd be like, hey, man, like McDonald's is always fucking hiring. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was cutthroat like that. If you don't yeah. want to fucking be here or you don't want to listen to us and you want to act like you know it all, like that's that's one thing I had to put. I had to put my ego to the side, man. I'd have been like, bro, I got to learn. Oh, yeah. I can't be the fucking teacher because I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Yeah. You know? So, hey, man, it, Mitch, I mean, I can call you Mitch, right? It's yeah, cool. Yeah, Mitch Mitchell. Mitch, man, it was a pleasure, man. I, I really appreciate you coming, man. It means a lot. Uh, we're about to wrap things up. Do you have anything else to say to the Dope Talk family, man? Like, anything nah. you want to say? Nah, man, March 4th, we got our next event here in Orlando. Cedric Lusant's going to be fighting on it. He's been one of your guests before. We got a, yep. a stacked card. Um, we got a few guys that will be in the UFC. You know, a guy like Chris Daniel, he's 9-2 and two looking at you know, getting to the next level. And so, yeah, that's it. Oh, hell yeah, bro. Hey, man, shout out to you, bro. Nigga, we made it. Uh -huh. We're going to have another one. We're going to have some more people coming to the show. And yo, man, appreciate you coming, bro. For sure, homie. Yes, sir. We out of here. Already cut us out, but.